Thank you, Richard, for uh, directing us to that small book of Ruth found in the Old Testament. Um, and so I would invite you to turn there because we're going to again visit the, the book of Ruth as we did last week. And if you weren't here last week, I want to just kind of bring you up to speed as to where we are because the little book of Ruth is uh, it's like reading a, a magazine article. It's not very long. It's only four chapters, and I would encourage you to read it on your own because there's a lot of things in there that we won't have time to discuss today. But it's about a little family, a little family living in Bethlehem. The dad, Limelech, and the mom was Naomi, and two boys, Malon and Kilion. And there was a famine there in Bethlehem, and so they ran out of food. Ironically, Bethlehem is called the house of bread, but there was no bread at that time. And so they heard that in a neighboring country down southeast of Bethlehem, a country called Moab, there was food there. So they immigrated to Moab and, and about 75 miles south and went there because there was food there, and the famine had not affected there. The sons uh, met a couple Moabite women and married them, Ruth and Orpha, and, and life was going swimmingly. Things were great. They had food. Uh, they were in a, in a place there. And, and then all of a sudden, over time, I suppose, things turned sour. The patriarch, Elimelech, died. After 10 years of marital bliss, both sons died, leaving three mourning widows and so as they're dealing with this in their life, this crisis in their life, they received news from, from Naomi's hometown, Bethlehem, that food was now growing there. The, the famine was now over. So she planned to move back to her hometown where her family was and her husband's family were. And she encouraged her daughters, who were again Moabite women, she encouraged them to stay there in Moab and to find nice gentlemen there that they could marry and, and start their lives over again, and, and to, to do that. And so amid tears uh, that all three of these women had, uh, they, she said, Orpha and, and Ruth, go back to your people and, and start a new life. Things aren't working out, and I'll go back to my people as well. Orpha, through tears, decided to do so, but Ruth, as you know, decided not to do so and decided to cling to Naomi. And she commits herself to stay with Naomi, risking everything in her life. Never getting married again, she knew, because uh, there was a law that Jewish men could not marry foreign women. She risked being looked down upon by the people in Bethlehem, and she risked the very real prospect of facing poverty and exclusion from society. So Naomi and Ruth, her daughter-in-law, traveled to Bethlehem. It ended up last week with the barley harvest that was first beginning. And we ended our thought last week by saying, God is up to something. Something is growing, and something's going to happen. And many of you know this story. But before we get into the story, we, we bump into a couple of Jewish customs here that might be foreign to us, and, and they kind of help to set the context for our story. Now, we're not going to get lost in the weeds, or the barley stalks, as it were, to contextualize it, but we're going to touch on a couple of these things. You see, back then there was no Social Security. That would be hard, wouldn't it, many of you who received that? There were no food stamps back then. There was no Medicaid back then, but there was God's security. And, and in the farmlands, in this society of, of this, this, this bucolic society of, of farmlands, there were laws regarding how the poor were to be cared for. And one of these involved the harvest. And one of these said that when you harvest your fields, leave a little bit behind so the poor can come and pick up leftover grain behind you. Some years ago, I had the, the, the blessed privilege, and I mean this in all sincerity, to have lunch with a rabbi. And I, I wanted to talk to him about his beliefs and learn about the Jewish customs and Jewish beliefs through the eyes of a rabbi. Because we, we teach a lot of things that Jewish people teach, but to sit and listen to one explain it was a unique experience for me. And one thing he said was that if you look back at Leviticus chapter 23 where we find the law about the stocks, here's, here's the directions from, from God. Leviticus 23.22 says this, When you reap the harvest of your land... Do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And he told me, he said, now, to the Jewish person, if you wanted to follow the exact law, you could leave one single stalk at the end of your field and you'd be following the law. 
But the expectation was to leave more than that. The expectation actually was to leave around 30% of your harvest so people can come behind you and pick it up. So the farmers had a choice. They could leave one stock there and say, I've done my duty. Or they could be generous and leave it for people. That's the first law, the Jewish custom that we're going to bump into today and for a very few, uh, very few brief moments. The other one is a thing called kinsman redeemer. We see that in the scriptures here. And the law applied equally to land as it did to people. And really it, was, it, was, it came from Levit Leviticus chapter 25. And it says that because the land belonged to God, it can't be sold outside the family. So, in essence, if someone becomes poor and has to sell their land, the nearest relative, the kinsman redeemer, they call it, is to come redeem that land and buy that property to keep it in the family, so to speak. But it not only applied to land, it also applied to, to marriage and to people. So, if a husband died without having any children, his nearest relative was to marry the widow and to carry on the family line. Now, you're thinking to yourself, what if I had to marry my sister-in-law? What if I had to marry my brother-in-law? You're thinking, that would not be a good thing, probably. Foreign to us. But these laws are laws and customs we bump into in this story. Now let's look at the story. We framed it here. Let's look into the book of Ruth, chapter 2 and chapter 3. The first verse of chapter 2 doesn't mess around. It says here, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Enter the story, Boaz, a businessman, a very influential man, one of Naomi's relatives, a man of standing in the community, a man of wealth. And Ruth asks her mother-in-law, she says, listen, can I go into a field in this village and can I glean, can I pick up leftover grain so that we can eat? I think it's interesting, verse 3 of Ruth chapter 2 says this, so she went out, Ruth, entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. These next words are interesting. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. As it turned out, um, it, the New, New American Standard Version says, she happened to. And if you read your Bible, it, there's a sense, it looks like it's a chance thing. Now, there's no indication in our scriptures that, that this was some kind of an intentional plan that she had to find Boaz's field. There were, there were no machinations going on as she went to the county courthouse and looked up who owned what property in that area and who maybe had been the most wealthy person and whose land she could go to. No indication of that. But God led her to that particular field as it turned out, our scriptures say. Now, this was God's will for her because he had a plan for her. Did she pray beforehand and go before the Lord and say, God, direct me to the, just the right land to glean? Perhaps, but perhaps not. Was, was this a spiritual decision she had that, that she would find this particular property? Perhaps, but perhaps not. She just made the decision based upon her best knowledge. And who knows, she could have walked down that dusty road and found the first field and walked into it following those who were doing so. How does God's will work for you and for me? Do we wait for a sign from him every time we have to make a choice? Every time? Big choices and small choices? If we're waiting for God to intervene and, and an angel to come and tell us about some of these choices, we're going to wait a long time, aren't we? That's a fact of life. He doesn't do that many times to us. He, but, but sometimes, as you know, as you follow the Lord, sometimes there's a nudge in our heart, isn't there? Sometimes someone says something to us that becomes a guidance for us. Sometimes we just have a hunch in our heart that we're following God's leading, and that helps to guide us when making decisions. But many times that doesn't happen, and you and I just have to plow ahead, don't we? using the best knowledge that we have and the best resources we have to make the choices. The famous preacher of, of days gone by, Dr. Harry Ironside, said this. He said, of all the decisions I make in my life, around 80% were made without knowing at the time they were God's will for me. I would challenge this probably that may be for you and me. We go through life, we make choices, not ignoring the Lord, but maybe not waiting for him to tell us directly what we're supposed to do. 
But often, as you can testify to, we can see God's working in our lives when we look back. And, and we, we can say to ourselves, you know, I didn't know it then, but now I see God's working in my circumstances. Or maybe we say, now I see what God protected me from, although I didn't know it. Now I see how he was leading me along that path, and I was wondering why in the world I was there. Ruth just chose a field, but this was all part of God's plan as he was putting the pieces in place. Verses 4 to 5 talks about Boaz. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. This is a businessman. This is a man who was doing business in town, and he came back, and these harvesters were most likely slaves. They were probably the bottom rung of the ladder. He probably didn't have to greet them. He was, he was a business person. He had a lot of wealth. But he went to these harvesters, these, these manual laborers, and said, The Lord be with you. And they said, The Lord be with you too. In Sunday school this morning, it was mentioned how sometimes we may forget to provide God's blessing to people. And and when we speak to a a waiter or a waitress or a cashier or someone, you know, that the challenge was given to us to say, God bless you. They may not respond. They may not know how to respond. Or they may say, God bless you too. That's something we can use from the book of Ruth because he was a businessman blessing his people. A godly man who treated his workers with respect and dignity. What an example to you and to me. Then starting at verse 5, it says he, rec- he noticed her. And he says to his workers, who is this lady among the workers? And, and as we heard this morning, he made special provision for her. And, and he was told, he learned, it's a small village, he learned how diligent she had been in working long hours in the field. And in verse 10, she says to him, as was read, she says, I, he says, I've been told all about, why have you noticed me a foreigner? When she used the word foreigner, this was not just referring to the fact that she wasn't from those parts. This was a pejorative term. This, this was not a flattering term. It, it was like, why are you treating me this way? I'm a stranger. I'm, I'm an alien. I'm not one of the people here. How are you treating me like this? Because I just don't deserve this not being of this community. And he says in verse 11, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. He knew who she was. He knew the blessing she was to her mother-in-law. He knew of her character, and he recognized that. And he said, I know everything about you and your family, and may God bless you for how you have blessed others. A businessman that didn't forget about the little people. The rest of chapter 2 talks about a relationship that develops. Fun reading here. And Noah's, um, excuse me, Naomi's mother, Naomi, her, Ruth's mother-in-law, she reveals to Ruth that Boaz is kinfolk, that he's a relative, and he's a close relative, and Ruth, she, Boaz might be the one who's going to help our family out of this crisis. So in chapter 3, as you can read on, time passes. We don't know how much time. And Naomi says to Ruth, I must find a home for you where you're going to be provided for. That's code for saying, I'm going to find you a husband. Can't you just hear the fiddler on the roof? I can. Got to find you a husband. And so Ruth is given instructions about how to make herself available for Boaz for marriage. On the threshing floor. This is a daring move. Because you see, the poor were allowed in the harvesting area, when when the grain was being pulled from the ground, when it was being harvested, and they were allowed there to pick up the leftover grain, but only certain people were authorized to be on the threshing floor. This is where the grains were, 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 were processed. This is where, as you well know, they would take the stalk and they would, they would run oxen over it and, and separate the stalk from the grain. Then they would throw the grain and the stalk up and, and the wind would blow the chaff away and the grain would fall down. This is something done by professionals, those who knew what they were doing. And the poor and the other workers, the laborers, were not allowed there unless they were authorized to be there. But she went to the threshing floor. Now verses 3 through 9 in chapter 3 are, are shrouded in mystery. 
There's a lot of Jewish culture in there. You can read about this. And no one really knows exactly what happened there. Some say the words in that passage euphemistically refer to, were to sexual connotations. Perhaps so, perhaps not. But we also know that Scripture tells us that Ruth was of noble character in chapter 3, verse 11. So there is an air of mystery there to what actually took place, and we're going to leave it at that. You can do your own study on what happened on the threshing floor that night. But I want to draw your attention to verse 8 of chapter 3. It begins with these words. In the middle of the night, something happened. The middle of the night in Scripture sometimes indicates this is a pivotal point. This is a change, a, a cataclysmic change in a different direction. And, and often the darkest time of the night is in the middle of the night. In life, you and I sometimes find ourselves, don't we, in the middle of the night. In the middle of our night. COVID-19 may have put us in the middle of the night in our spirit. Wounded spirits may have put us in the middle of the night in our souls. Broken relationships could have placed us in the middle of our night. Guilt or shame could have put us in the middle of the night. You fill in the blanks for your own life. So what do we do when, when in our own lives we are in a place that we may term the middle of the night for us? Oswald Chamber poses this question rhetorically. Have we come to the point where God can withdraw his blessings from us without our trust in him being affected? In other words, will you allow yourself to be in the middle of the night and still keep your eyes on God? When you and I face the middle of our nights, stay focused on God. Be assured the middle of the night passes. The sun's going to rise. Keep things first. Keep first things first. And hold on to the promise that he gives us that you can never, ever go beyond the reach of God's love, even in the middle of our night. So in this story, Ruth lets Boaz know that she's interested in being considered for marriage. And he tells her in verse 11, don't be afraid. I will take care of you. I'll, I'll make sure that you're taken care of. But Boaz is also a man of integrity, highest integrity. And he said, you know, I'm not the closest kin to you. There's someone else who really is a closer relative, and this person really has, has the, the, the first right of refusal. It's not me. And so the chapter 3 ends with, again, what's going on? Is this a good sign? Is this a bad sign? I think it's interesting, Naomi's instructions to Ruth here in the 18th verse of chapter 3. Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Sometimes when you and I might be in the middle of our nights, we need to follow the example and the instruction of Naomi. Naomi who took the name Mara, bitterness because of her sorrow. And she says to us, you know, sometimes we may just need to wait Things may not turn out as we think they may, or things may not turn out as we want them to. But she says, the matter will be resolved some way. We just need to wait to see how it happens. But when we trust in God, in the end, ultimately, it will all turn out okay. Because God has a plan. God's in control. I've quoted this before, and it's Bears quoting again, a quote from Max Lucado about challenging. He says, listen, you'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. In the meantime, don't be foolish or naive. But don't despair either. Because with God's help, you will get through this. And Ruth and Naomi knew that somehow this would work out. They had no idea how Ruth, as an alien, as a stranger in a strange land, Ruth, who, who allowed herself to be put in a place where things would not work out, where she'd be looked down upon because of who she was, somehow things are changing. And we'll talk about that next week. Let's bow for prayer. Our God, we thank you for the fact that you have a plan for us.
We thank you that sometimes we may go through times where we sense it's the middle of the night. And Father, when that happens, we pray that you will remind us that, that the night passes and the, the dawn takes place. And God, when we're in the middle of the night of our own lives, if ever it should take place, help us to keep following you. Help us to, to remember that even though your blessings may for a time be taken away, our faith will not waver in you because faith is exercised when it's difficult to do so. God, we pray that you'll bless us each one as we strive to follow your will in our life. And as, as Ruth went to a field, just picked a field, but didn't know exactly what the plan was, sometimes we make choices. We may not know what the plan is, but God, we thank you for guiding us and for giving us the wherewithal to make choices that are often the best choices without sp particular mm, heavenly beings coming and telling us what to do. But through your, your, your soft voice, your quiet voice that guides us, in many of our decisions. Thank you for the promise of your presence. Thank you for the promise of your guidance. For it's in your holy and your precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song that talks about relationship with God, fellowship with the spirit of eternal love. Guide me or I blindly rove. Set my heart on things above. Draw me after thee. As we sing this song, and you see the words up there, if you want to bow your heads, that's fine. If you want to come here and kneel here, if you feel that, that coming here will, will help to, to, to make you closer to the Lord, do that. Spend this time as we sing and listen, getting to know the Lord better and receiving from Him the assurance that if you're in the middle of the night, the sun is going to come up.
bow our heads. As you go out into your field of service, may you spread God's blessings on those around you as Boaz did. May you trust the Lord to guide you as Ruth did. And if going through your own middle of the night, may you trust God to bring you through it as Naomi did. Amen and amen. God bless you.